This is a short video on syphilis. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of syphilis, including primary, secondary, and tertiary syphilis. As in all of these videos, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes in the flowchart and repopulating the flowchart as we talk about each concept. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, syphilis starts with a bacteria called Treponema pallidum. This is a gram-negative bacteria. It's spiral-shaped, and it's in the spirochete family. It can be transmitted through a few different ways. By far, the most common way to transmit syphilis is through sexual contact. This is through small, like, mucocutaneous lesions, and we'll talk about the primary syphilis lesions more in just a second. You can get syphilis from vaginal contact, anal contact, or oral contact. So any way that you sexually contact another person, you can transmit syphilis if they have this primary lesion. You can also transmit syphilis vertically, so from mother to child during pregnancy or childbirth. And in rare cases, you can transmit syphilis through blood transfusion or organ donations, but that's the most rare way to transmit syphilis. Usually, it's through sexual contact. When you transmit syphilis through sexual contact, the treponemes, that's the bacteria, they cause an obliterating and arteritis at the entry site. This is what causes the primary lesions, also called the syphilis chankers. And this is the presentation, this is the manifestation of primary syphilis. So these lesions, they usually start out as a solitary raised papule, and it's usually on the genitals in 95, 90 to 95% of cases. It can also be around the anal region and also on the fingers, um, so there, it's possible for it to not be on the genitals, but it usually is. So it starts off as a solitary raised papule, and it develops into a painless, firm ulcer with indurated borders and a smooth base. This lesion then resolves on its own spontaneously within three to six weeks without any kind of scarring. It's notable to say that this is a non-tender lesion, and it's also painless, so it can cause non-tender regional lymphadenopathy as well, but neither the lymphadenopathy nor the lesion itself are painless. This is because the bacteria actually obliterates, destroys the sensory vasa nervorum, so that there's ischemic death of this of, of, of these nerves, so it, it doesn't cause pain at all. This helps you contrast syphilis with other genital lesions that might be painful, like herpes, for instance. No matter how you get syphilis, sexual contact, vertical transmission, or blood transfusion, it ends up spreading throughout the body. It disseminates throughout the body through the bloodstream and the lymphatics. And this can happen within hours. You'll have spirochetes throughout the body. This is how you end up getting secondary syphilis. The spirochetes cause an inflammatory reaction. They cause endarteritis, and that can be an obliterating endarteritis that causes ischemia and necrosis, and they also cause perivascular inflammatory infiltrates. This is essentially a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. This is what, as I mentioned, causes secondary syphilis, which presents kind of throughout the body. It's a more systemic reaction. And syphilis is known as the great imitator. So you'll see that the manifestations that we talk about here are kind of represented in many other diseases. It could be um, in many different organ systems as well. And we'll see that in just a second. So first, secondary syphilis can have non-tender regional lymphadenopathy, and it can also have fever, fatigue, myalgias, and headaches. That's just standard um, infectious symptoms, so nothing unique there. The first kind of unique symptom is the polymorphic rash that syphilis can have. This typically starts as a disseminated, non-paritic, macular or papular rash. It involves the trunk, the extremities, the palms, and the soles. It's typically reddish-brown in color or copper colored, and it heals within six months. It's possible that this rash goes away and comes back, so you can have recurrence of the rash. The secondary, or the second characteristic symptom of secondary syphilis is condylomata lata. These are broad-based, wart-like, smooth, white papular erosions. They tend to be painless, and they're located in anogenital regions, intertriginous folds, or on oral mucosa. So remember the characteristic syphilis rash and the condylomata Lata, and those are the secondary syphilis characteristics. It's also worth noting that syphilis is most contagious in stage one or stage two of the disease, so during primary or secondary syphilis. So that's how it spreads from one person to another. Syphilis can then enter a latent phase where it can uh, still be present in the patient's blood. The patient still is seropositive, but the patient doesn't have symptoms. And it's possible that the disease ends here. Some patients never progress to tertiary syphilis. 
Others might progress as tertiary syphilis with, within months or maybe years, but it's kind of variable from patient to patient at this point. Tertiary syphilis, again, can affect many different organ systems, and we'll talk about the most classic manifestations here. So first, the bacteria can induce a vasculitis of the vasa vasorum, and, of, and that's the vasa vasorum of the large vessels. This can result in an aortitis, or a syphilic mesoaortitis. This can also result in vessel wall atrophy. This is going to weaken the vessel walls and allow them to dilate, which results in aneurysms. So they can have ascending aortic aneurysms, that's th thoracic aortic aneurysms, as well as aortic root dilation and insufficiency. So syphilis can start to affect the heart in this way. In addition, this latent syphilis can become reactivated and cause a perivascular inflammatory reaction. This essentially creates granulomas that can be distributed throughout the body. Remember, granulomas are these pathological findings where you have many monocytes all clustered together. And these granulomas in various organs are called gummas. They form these destructive lesions that tend to necrose and ulcerate, and they can be in any organ. On the skin, they're very visible. You can see them with their necrotic centers and their ulcerations, but they can also affect the central nervous system, for instance. And when they do, it's called neurosyphilis. Now, there are some key findings in neurosyphilis that are worth knowing about. Neurosyphilis doesn't arise in everybody. It typically arises in people who have immunosuppression. And a common ca case is when a patient has a co-infection with HIV, for instance, since both of these are sexually transmitted diseases. If you have HIV and syphilis, you might be more at risk for neurosyphilis. So I was mentioning neurosyphilis has some pretty uh, characteristic findings. First, you can have acute meningeal syphilis. This is essentially the symptoms of meningitis, but you're aseptic. So if you were to do a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture on these patients, you won't find any bacteria. This can present as a neck stiffness or nausea for the patient. You can also have meningovascular syphilis, which can present as subacute strokes or cranial neuropathies. Then come the characteristic ones. There's the argyle robertson pupil. This presents as a bi bilateral meiosis in the patient, so their pupils are very, very tiny on both sides. The pupils also accommodate but do not react to light, so that's unusual. Usually the pupils will accommodate and react to light at the same time, but if they accommodate but do not react, then you might suspect argyle robertson pupil in neurosyphilis. Lastly, for neurosyphilis, you can have tabes dorsalis. This is when you have demyelination of the dorsal columns and the dorsal root ganglia. This can result in impaired proprioception in the patient, which can then progress to sensory broad-based ataxia. The patient will have a positive Romberg sign because they have this broad-based ataxia. The patient might also lose their deep tendon reflexes. They might lose sensation in their lower extremities, and they can have sharp shooting pains in the legs and on the abdomen. They can also end up with charco joints um, of the lower extremities as well. Lastly, it's worth discussing the jarish herxheimer reaction. This is a reaction that you get from the spirochetes that are disseminated throughout the body when you start antibiotic treatment in the patient for syphilis. So it's an acute transient systemic response to a bacterial endotoxin-like substance and pyrogens that are released after you start antibiotics. And it's most often seen when you start antibiotics in the early phases of the second stage. So early secondary syphilis plus antibiotics tends to result in this reaction. The symptoms you'll get here can be flu-like, fever, chills, headaches, myalgias. You can have tachypnea, hypotension, and tachycardia. And this reaction is typically self-limiting within 12 to 24 hours. Usually you'll just provide the patient with supportive care like NSAIDs, anti-inflammatories to help them get through it. This has been a video on syphilis. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.